the food industry is not going to change. We have to change where we spend our money and what choices we make of those foods. As the food industry developed these neat tricks, like creating refined sugars, but then adding into foods and realizing, hey, food can be tastier. If you're looking at that label, make sure that you know what's in it because it could have tons of different types of sugar. Dr. Uma Naidu is a Harvard trained board certified psychiatrist. And what also makes her truly exceptional is that she's a nutrition specialist with her education from Cornell University, plus a professional chef with her education from Cambridge School of Culinary Arts. She's currently the Director of Nutritional and Lifestyle Psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital, where she consults on nutritional interventions for psychiatry and medically ill patients. As a board certified psychiatrist, I've gotta ask you this. From your perspective, have the rates of anxiety been going up in recent years or even recent decades? Yeah. Because you get to see this firsthand. And I'm just, I want to ask you about this personally. Yeah, it has. So Sean, even before the pandemic, anxiety was actually the most common mental health disorder in the United States. Many people don't realize that. It was always about three times more common than even something like depression. But during the pandemic, it, and hence the reason for my book, it really worsened. In the early pandemic times, in around spring of 2020, a medication called Zoloft, sertraline, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor went on shortage in the entire United States. Doctors and prescribers were getting emails and calls from pharmacies saying you need to find a solution for individuals who are taking this. And the reason behind it was there were new diagnoses of anxiety, maybe some mood disorders around that time. So these were not these were new prescriptions, and that's why we ran out. Um, we know that, of course, this had a toll, but The Lancet published a paper saying that something I feel like I've seen and experienced, that the increase is 25% as we've gone through the pandemic, which is a massive jump. And so I feel like there need to be more solutions than just that prescription pad because other information and research has shown us that even when you take a medication for anxiety, you may not ever feel the relief of it. In fact, larger percentage of people don't get a cure or don't even have remission from anxiety. So we need more solutions. Actually, you posted not too long ago a, a more recent paper, which some of this data has been known for quite some time. And actually, we just talked about Dr. Caroline Leaf yes. out before the show. And she shared with me, it's decades ago that this was pretty well established that the serotonin theory of depression is largely disproven in certain scientific circles. Mm -hmm. But now a more recent paper came out kind of addressing this yes. because SSRIs have been a billion dollar industry. Yes. But you just shared a lot of times people aren't actually finding relief, especially enduring relief. Correct, uh, especially uh, enduring relief. I like how you phrase that because you might get initial relief but it's not sustainable or you develop side effects. So there, there's a whole spectrum. I think it goes back to the fact that with, with diagnostic criteria, we have the DSM-5-TR. It's not like if you come in, Sean, and you have a cough. I can get a sputum test, I can order different, you know, I can order an x-ray and order several things and actually treat what I know might be infecting you. It's not that way in mental health. We can't just do a brain biopsy. We, we, we have these diagnostic criteria and people very often have a mixed set of symptoms. Um, then when we get to the medications, we have had a very heavy sort of reliance on the serotonin hypothesis. And a study published in the British Medical Journal, which I referenced in my book um, last year, and I, I'm careful about how I frame this because I'm not trying to say if you're taking a selective ser an SSRI, stop your medication, I'm not saying that at all. Talk to your doctor, examine the data for yourself, have a conversation with the provider. But essentially this, this uh, research group in the UK essentially said, you know, there's not much basis for this. And the way I see this is it has spun off into the pharmaceutical industry in a very big way, the reliance that we have on um, SSRIs. And I feel like we just need to have a longer, bigger conversation about this so people have more solutions. And that's where I do feel food is one of those lifestyle pillars that can make a difference that we often overlook. Yeah, it's so fascinating. And of course, talking with you and your traditional education and then your education so far beyond, you know, your university education and what you're doing, you're, I don't use this word lightly. And also I don't wanna paint this as like you've been 
uh, doing this for s super long, but you are a pioneer in this field. You know, Thank nutritional you. psychiatry is really something that you push forward into okay. our culture and have such a prestigious um, clinic to help people through the use of, of nutrition. And I want to I want to point us back to this because it's so fascinating. You just said it. You know, you have a manual that we're educated on to treat patients with mental health, yeah. and it's fitting into certain criteria, and it's often based on behavior or yes. conversation. Mm -hmm. But we're not actually testing. Does this person have some kind of issue with serotonin? It's based off of a theory. Uh, based off of a theory, and there isn't. You know, yes, we can do blood tests and we can check this and that. But it's it's not as clear as a liver biopsy. It's not as clear as other diagnoses and other specialties. So I feel we're already a little bit in the dark in psychiatry, and I think we need to acknowledge that, and feel and and offer guidance based on that. But that's where I feel, and this happened early on in my career. I'm not against medications. The medications I've said this to you before, Sean, have saved the lives of many of my patients. But it's not the solution for everyone. And when it, when it is even a partway solution, food, nutrition, and lifestyle factors can always help because maybe you don't need as high a dose. Maybe over time your provider can work with you to taper you safely off a medication. But, you know, I've been talking to, to a group that I work with in the United Kingdom, and they even talking about things like serotonin addiction because they find that the prescriptions to the GPs are so high because they don't have other solutions. Yeah. So it's, it's a big deal. Yeah. You know, it should seem obvious at this point that, you know, healthy lifestyle factors, things that we evolve doing that our genes expect from us, yeah. that our DNA requires in order for healthy cellular function and replication, yes. these, these basic things, if they're not done, we are just kind of, you know, window dressing. And you pointed out in your book, and this was such a strong statement, that the American diet is actually fueling higher rates of anxiety. Can you talk a little bit about why that is? It is. You know, unfortunately, um, for, for the most part in America, we are led by things like the standard American diet, which, you know, sad, called SAD for a reason, um, the acronym, and it's also called the Western diet. And that diet is really very high in processed, ultra-processed junk foods and fast foods. We know that some fast food french fries have added sugar in them to make them hyper palatable. Um, so when people go to that drive through they upsize and when they when they get that larger size of fries, they eat they eat it. And then the next time it's lunch, they feel for it again because it's starting to tap into our craving cycle. But these foods are engineered a certain way. Um, we also have a very heavy reliance on just sugar in many of our foods, including things like bread. And if you've not eaten a certain product for a while and you go back and taste it, maybe you're at a dinner or at an event, you will actually realize there's so much sugar in some basic foods that we eat, including savory foods. Um, so the added and refined sugars are a problem, the high fructose corn syrup, um, the, the sodas, the, the, the sports beverages that are loaded up with sugar and things like that. We also um, know that through the foods we eat, and some sometimes the fact that we eat those processed foods is a lot of um, processed vegetable and seed oils that can actually drive inflammation. So that's another thing that's in our food as well. Then there's artificial sweeteners. There's some newer sweeteners where there's some really exciting and newer data, but for the most part, the sweeteners that are on the foods that are labeled diet or low, low sugar or um, no sugar um, have, are, are problematic, especially in the diet sodas. Um, and then it's the sort of unhealthy fats. Things think, you know, there's shelf-stable baked goods that you you can buy this week and you can you can serve it next week. And, and they're shelf-stable because they kind of pumped up with sort of preservatives and colorants and dyes and all that stuff, but also the wrong types of fats, right? The trans fats and the hydrogenated oils, which are really pro-inflammatory for our bodies. Because we tend to eat this kind of diet without a reliance on fiber and vegetables and a plant, I would say a plant-rich diet, and balancing that nutritional psychiatry plate with the right proteins, um, fats, and um, even complex carbs, we've, we've kind of gotten our, our meals into disarray. Mm. And, and that, is, that is definitely driving anxiety, and it worsened uh, during the pandemic. Let's break down a little bit why sugar 
is so troubling when it comes to anxiety? Where, yeah. Why is sugar something that can exacerbate symptoms of anxiety? Yeah. I think it's a little bit of a trick. And, and this is what I mean. The times that people will say, but you know, when I'm, I'm really anxious, I, I just, I want that candy bar. I, I need that, um, that soda or that, you know, very fancy coffee with tons of ingredients. I just need that because it's gonna make me feel better. It's gonna calm me down. And the funny thing is that in the short term, you actually may feel a little bit better um, that kind of is tricking our brain because that initial rush of sugar may f- make you feel better. It's the long-term effect that is actually problematic um, and, and in fact has been shown to damage neurons over time. So if, if, our subs- if we're subsisting on that sugar-laden diet, we are damaging our brain over time. The other thing that sugar does is that it drives inflammation in the gut and in the brain. So we are feeding those not not so great, not so cool microbes down in our gut microbiome. And when they thrive, they upset the environment of the gut. They lead to dysbiosis and inflammation in the gut. Over time, their toxic breakdown products damage the cell lining of the gut. um, And you get leakage into the circulatory system you eventually, you know, develop inflammation in the gut, leaky gut, or intestinal permeability over time. So sugar is problematic on multiple levels, and it is hard to extract from our diet. So I, I, I just try to guide people toward extra, not, extra dark natural chocolate, towards pieces of fruit, towards berries, rather than a reliance on just, you know, candy, which is what we used to, candy and um, candy and cakes and that kind of stuff. Mental health is really brain health. You know, it's a big, big part of this. And you just shared, if we could just get this as a society, like Mm -hmm. sugar is not without a cost. You know, this is something that was not a part of our diet as a species, literally until about 150 years ago, Mm -hmm. it it became more prevalent, but it's really 50, 60, 70 years ago, Mm -hmm. where there's this huge upswing in Mm -hmm. its consumption and availability. And we went from, you know, around the 1900s, maybe under 10 pounds of mm-hmm. added sugar mm-hmm, mm-hmm. per person yes. in the United States or in the Western world yes. uh, per year. And that number is skyrocketed. It's at least 70 pounds per person. Some reports estimate closer to 100 pounds mm-hmm. of added sugars per person. And you just shared, again, if we could get this, this can potentially this sugar consumption is damaging our neurons Mm -hmm. and this is where all the magic is happening with our mood and with our cognitive function right you're right and and thank you for pointing out those statistics because we we now eat so much sugar and and as the food industry developed um these neat tricks like like you know creating um, refined sugars but then adding into foods and realizing hey food can be tastier, you know, and people are going to want to eat those foods. So um, it, it, it caught it kind of caught on. And then it was developing high fructose corn syrup. And let's see what we can put, where, where can we put that and ended up in almost all foods. So even savory foods um, have a ton of sugar that you don't even realize is there. So now you'll see healthier brands coming up with ketchup with, you know, they'll have a label, low sugar or no sugar or no added sugar. And that's the reason because a lot of those foods have a ton of sugar that you don't even, you don't even realize is there. I was just about to say ketchup. (laughs) This past weekend, my son had a basketball tournament Mm -hmm. and we got room service and they sent these little things of Heinz ketchup. And it was high fructose corn syrup was one of the ingredients. And I'm just like, man, this is, you know, bananas has been there for years. And it's so unsuspecting. So many of these products that we come in contact with have this high fructose corn syrup and also you know if you think about the brain itself it runs primarily on glucose Mm -hmm. and you know your work has been you know um, a a lot of what you've done and also your education uh, with Harvard and some researchers there found that it was something like 50 percent of the sugar that we consume in a given meal can get shuttled to the brain because the brain evolved to really snatch up a lot mm-hmm. of the sugar that mm-hmm. we consume, but yeah. it used to be a small percentage it used to be much of our, of our yeah. diet. Yeah. But now this kind of abhorrent amount of sugar that we have access to, is just driving up to the brain in droves. And this is one of the things we're seeing potentially with Alzheimer's yes. as well. Mm-hmm. And this category of 
you know, is, is being labeled by some scientists as type three diabetes. Yes, yeah, some, some people are calling it that, and, um, you know, not everyone agrees with that term, but here's the thing, it's, it's pointing to a mechanism, it's, it's pointing to, the, to a way in which society has actually evolved and changed that is driving disease in a certain way. I also see this, Sean, a lot with, uh, in a lot of questions about children's mental health, and why are we seeing so much more of these specific conditions? And I can't not include the fact that this conversation has to involve the food we, we're feeding children and that we're all consuming. But are we seeing that uptick because there's such a reliance on those foods? Yeah. And there are things, simple things like condiments. You're not thinking to yourself when you're eating something else <laughs> that I should worry about the condiment, but those are often, even salad dressings, loaded with um, not only high fructose corn syrup, but you know just other, other n ingredients that are um, not good for us. For example, there's a study in an animal study, and you know I'll just preface this by saying we have to start the study somewhere, and then we have to to move them to humans. But I thought what was significant about this one is it looked at the microbiome and a, a, a substance called carboxymethylcellulose, which is actually a thickener in food. And so the CMC was damaging the microbiome of these mice, and they had less of an ability to form the short-chain fatty acids that we need. This was a 2022 study. So what it informed me of, it's not diagnostic, it's not, you know, we need more information, but it at least alerts us to the fact that it is a problem. And where do we find those ingredients in, you know, kind of processed, ultra-processed foods, thickening something or, or whatever it is. So it's the sugar, it's the other processed ingredients, and until we find our way forward, we're not, no one has to be a perfect eater, but at least stepping back from some of that, yeah. um, finding those you know healthier ketchups or w whatever it might be for what we eat and enjoy. Yeah, I, I, today's conversation is a nudge towards paying attention to the smaller things too. This is because true. You know, we don't think about stuff like that, about our condiments, for example. We don't. You know, and when I was a kid, and I'm not exaggerating, well, maybe I am a little bit, but I think my blood was like 5% ketchup. You know what I mean? Like fish sticks, ketchup. Mm -hmm. Nuggets, ketchup. Ketchup. Eggs, yeah. ketchup. Ketchup, yeah. Everything with, except bologna sandwiches, okay. I, because I have some self-respect. I didn't put ketchup on that. I put mustard. And shout out to people who put ketchup on bologna. No disrespect, but you know everything. And I would even joke about it. You know, I yeah. I'd tell people like I'm I'm black and white and red because I eat so, <laughs> much, eat ketchup, so much ketchup, or I'm black and white and orange because I eat you know a lot of cheese or whatever cheese, it was. Yeah. Um, but I knew the foods that I liked, which right. you know right. these condiments, salad dressing, things like that. But the good news is there are a lot of companies who are doing things with more. Uh, efficacy and intelligence mm -hmm. right. and care who are not yes. putting these crazy trying, amounts of added sugars and things like that foods, yeah. or even higher quality sweeteners or making them lower glycemic and things right. like that. So if we could even just make little shifts like that and pay attention to the uh, accessory items, that can be helpful. I, I like what you're saying because a lot of people will pick on the fact that, oh, well, you know, why are you talking about foods? Not just on me, but just the, the concept of foods in moderation, balancing where you get those calories from or cutting back. I think it's very hard in this environment to say to people, just give up all processed foods, never look at one, ne you know, because it's hard. It, yeah. We have grown a reliance on these foods. But the ones that you choose matters. Where you put your dollars matters. The choices do matter. They matter to your physical health, but also your mental health. And here is, is where I think making those healthier choices of whether you're even seeing um, meat products that have now I've seen them saying no added nitrates in them. Um, you know, studies have shown that nitrates can worsen depression. I don't think the food industry is doing it for that reason. I think they're doing it to show that they're trying to be healthier. Mm -hmm. But even when we make those choices, it could be that slight tweak that is helping us because we know that we're consuming more sugar. We know that our dinner plate has increased in size from about eight to nine inches about 60 years ago to 10 to 11 inches now. So even the size of our portions has increased. And if if you think of the size of portion have increased and we're eating more sugar as well, that's a lot more of the, the less healthy ingredients. Yeah, um, I love this. I'm, I'm glad that you pointed out specifically, you know, with our kids and mm -hmm. ultra processed food consumption. Yeah. I cannot state this enough. Uh, JAMA, Journal of the American mm -hmm. Medical Association did a 
20 year study mm -hmm. looking at ultra processed food consumption by US kids. Mm -hmm. In 1999, the average child's diet in the United States was 61% ultra processed mm. fake food. Mm. And by 2018, that number had risen to 67.5%, almost 70% of our children's diet is mm -hmm. ultra processed ultra food. Processed, yeah. And as you know, that's the average. So there's gonna be ch children at the lower end and, and higher end of the and spectrum. And the high end, yeah. I was definitely higher end wow, of the spectrum wow, wow. Um, with my ultra processed food consumption. Yeah. And my health demonstrated that. Yeah. You know, all right. these chronic conditions, mm -hmm. chronic asthma, mm -hmm. allergies, chronic pain. I had an advanced arthritic condition with my spine at 20 years old, which is, wow. that's years in the making to wow. have that wow. level of degeneration mm -hmm. that I had. And it's just, I was making my tissues, my right. neurons, right. Right. the fuel that my body was running on out of very, very low mm -hmm. quality, new, newly mm -hmm. invented mm -hmm. artificial ingredients. Right. And what we're advocating for is, we're not going to ignore the fact that there are the, all these delicious things that exist mm. today, but what we want to do is shift our ratio some. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, instead of seventy percent of our diet being that for our children, mm -hmm. let's shift that ratio, maybe fifty percent, or right. maybe we can shift it, just flip those numbers and do right. thirty percent ultra processed foods exactly. and seventy percent real minimally processed foods. Exactly, I really appreciate that because I feel it's about where people get lost is they get into this. Um, th this way split mentality. It's either this or that. I think we need to find that gray zone that works for more people. Um, in other words, how can you in your diet make, make that adjustment toward a healthier plate? In the moment, in the day, in the week, um, for your family, maybe slightly better choices. Though we start with awareness, right? The, there's a repository, as you know, Sean, for other names, and I, I want people to know this because I want them to read food labels, for other names for sugar and food labels. The number the last time I checked was 262. So if a parent, a mom, a dad, whoever it is doing this food shopping, including, say, a teenager, if you're looking at that label, make sure that you know what's in it because it could have tons of different types of sugar mm -hmm. and you don't even realize and it could be a savory food so having those little things that we educate ourselves with is key because the food industry is not going to change we have to change where we spend our money and what choices we make of those foods and they're slightly healthier versions of everything now yeah and you've got to educate yourself because food yeah. companies will health wash they, and they yeah, might throw gluten free it, yeah. on the label but That's then right. there's like 10 other sugars in there, right. you know, just, you know, what we need to do, of course, education is a huge part of this. Books like yours, Calm Your Mind with Food is the new Thank book. You. By the way, everybody should pick up a copy like yesterday. But, you know, for us to be empowered and to understand, even last night, for example, yeah. you know, my, my wife made a real food dinner. Mm -hmm. Every mm -hmm. one of those, there was three different items. You could tell where they came from, Great. all right? Yeah, love that. Uh, a lot of those foods don't even necessarily need a label. Right. But then, because it's Christmas time, <laughs> she made some Christmas cookies. Right, right. And right. what she did was just use higher quality mm -hmm. ingredients that she could. Yeah. And this morning I went over, because I didn't want to ask questions, mm -hmm. all right? And it was just a, it was a special moment. You know, she came over with the cookies. She was so happy. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, there were sprinkles on there yeah. and they had different colors. So mm -hmm. of course my mind is like, I wonder what these dyes are, <laughs> right? And I went in there this morning and I saw the sprinkles sitting there on the counter right. and there was like green sprinkles. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, as you know, some of these food dyes are uh, indicated for increasing symptoms rega regarding ADHD yes. and it's particular for children. And, but the, the green food dye, and this was, you know, we just got them from Whole Foods. Yeah. It was colored with spirulina to make mm -hmm, it green. Mm -hmm. And then there was another color. Was, um, there was like a blend of color. One was like beet. Beet. And beet then can like be right, right. Com combined with spirulina or whatever to make right. this other color. It's just like wow. they're they're paying attention to those things. It's still, we got to be clear, still the sugar, mm -hmm. sweetener, that right. kind of thing. But it's a but just like little steps yeah. to like pull away a couple of toxins. And also, again, the meal itself, real food. And then we had a little bit of like ultra. They're still cookies, yeah. ultra processed right. food. Yeah. You know. But it's, it's your little snack. It's it's the holidays. Having that balance is critical for us. Like I don't ever want a person to feel you cannot. If you love birthday cake on your birthday, you should not feel that you can't have a piece. But I do feel that what I'm going to encourage you to do is have that piece, but not have that be your every night dessert. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and I feel like that's a little bit missed in the conversation in nutrition, Sean, because yeah. people are advocating to for a very split society around 
only eat these foods, never eat that, exclude certain food groups. And I feel like if you are metabolically flexible and more metabolically fit, um, you you can eat a little bit more grains. You can you can switch out your plate because you're exercising. You you've reached a point of healthfulness. But if you're at a point where many of my patients are at, um, and I have been at certain stages in my life as well, like on a pathway to improving, your body may not be able to tolerate those ingredients in the same way, yeah. and you may have to be more careful about you know, where you get your carbohydrates from and you want more of the complex carbohydrates from vegetables and things like that than, than, than eating the other things that many Americans enjoy, like, you know, sandwiches and, and pasta. Again, it's not demonizing the food. It's where are you at that you can make an adjustment. So I really, I, I really like what you said because even, even when people understand things like you can use the color of beets to, beets, by the way, have positive substances for your heart but you can use the color to to make certain things at, at Christmas time you know you you can actually almost employ that powdered beet which may not have you have to read the ingredients but may not have additional sugar beets are sweet but use that for things that you're creating you know I, I really like that yeah part of our metabolic flexibility has to do with our own unique microbiome yes and you talk about that in the book as well can you share why our gut bacteria are a major key for controlling anxiety it turns out that um there are there have been studies and several different uh of the species lactobacillus have been associated with different ways that they can actually help anxiety um, some manipulate the GABA receptors, and we know that GABA is related to anxiety. Some work through serotonin and dopamine. So there are about six to eight lact of the group lactobacillus that have these effects. And I run through some of those in the book. So, so it may not be that you, uh, you know where it's coming from, but you have an awareness that these little guys, these microbes, are pretty powerful in impacting us, both in a good way and a not so good way, right? But if you are harnessing through the through eating, you know, many prebiotic foods, just paying attention to fiber, paying attention to the kaleidoscope of colors in the plant foods that we're eating, because it's so much more than just the colors of the rainbow. It's a million more colors, and it's a million more nutrients that we we can get when you when you're doing that. You're actually you're uplifting and enhancing them. And when they are thriving, they can function because they don't just hang out. They deal with sleep and circadian rhythm, which is our internal body clock. They deal with immunity. 70% of our immune system is in the gut. They deal with um, vitamin production, hormone production. They impact sleep. Um, they also deal with mental health and fight infections and do more. So these guys are busy. And if we take care of them, they are going to tap into forming the right types of breakdown products of our food that our bodies need to thrive, but also that our brains need. There's a lot going on in our gut. <laughs> that is, that's <laughs> crazy. Little... You know, this reminded me when you mentioned the circadian aspect. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, cr it's crazy to say this now, but my first book, the first iteration of my first book, it's almost 10 years, been about nine years. About sleep, right? Sleep smarter, yes, yeah. Yes, yes. And mm -hmm. in the book, I shared some research from Caltech, and they uncovered that our gut bacteria are communicating with enterochromaffin cells in the gut that are producing sleep-related hormones and neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we're talking about serotonin, for example. It's, yeah, it's related to our mood, but it's also a precursor to making melatonin. Yes. And our bacteria are just in close communication with these cells. It's just like this incredible interplay. But what if our bacteria are mm -hmm. not balanced? We don't have good yeah. diversity. Right. Then we can start to see all manner of dysfunction start to happen. And one of the things that love that book, by the way. Um, a lot of that can actually show up as sleep in mental health because when your sleep is off, um, people can be more anxious. Their, um, you know, their appetite can change, and I've seen this happen in my clinical practice. And one of the things that happened in the pandemic is, you know, people were calling insomnia, coronasomnia, because it was just getting to be so bad for many people in part driven by the level of angst I think everyone was living with and just disruption. So we're beyond that now. So it's, it's a time, kind of time to regroup and see what can we do to move ourselves forward, right? I, I think that many of us 
we often view anxiety as a negative, but we can also use it to our, we can, we can use it to empower ourselves. If we yeah. learn, similarly like we're learning a food label, if we learn how to manage it a little bit better and find these alternate solutions that are just beyond the pull, you know, beyond that actual pull. I'm at a place now where I'm just, I'm, I marvel at how intelligent our bodies are. Yeah. You know, it's just, we, we, we're, we're so far from truly understanding. We, we know some things now, mm -hmm. but our bodies are giving us feedback all the time, mm -hmm. you know, in regards, like you just mentioned, anxiety can be a directive. It can be mm -hmm. something that we can pay attention to and to make adjustments, mm -hmm. you know, with our behavior, with our environment, whatever the case might be. But unfortunately, we see it as just this, this bad thing right. and I can't do anything about it. It's just happening to me but you are putting the power in our hands mm -hmm. with this and really directing us to like, what is one of the biggest contributing factors in our culture with mm -hmm. our increasing rates of anxiety yes. and also happening in younger and younger populations, Yes, our diet has to be addressed. And you know, with that being said, let's talk about some of these anxiety busting nu nutrients and foods right. that we can look at adding in. Um, I want to just mention that there's so many, one of the things I, I do in the book, Sean, and I want to go to two of these ingredients, is realizing that there are many things we're overlooking. Like, I'm going to go to this list in a second, but iron. Uh, there are many women of childbearing age and many children and adolescents, I personally feel it comes back to the food system, who are deficient in iron. And um, it's not something that we necessarily realize. Um, but it is correlated with a high level of anxiety in younger folks. So I think it's just something to realize if we're not eating nutritious food, we're not getting that supply of iron that our bodies need. It might need to be supplemented, we need to speak to your doctor, we need to get a level, but women as well. But I, I list a lot of foods that I go through in the book, but for the purpose of kind of having people just have almost a little cheat sheet in their head, I break it down into a mnemonic calms and again, these are only a few of the foods, but C is for choline, which, you know, is an important nutrient. Um, people often overlook it. It can be found in from legumes to eggs. So there's lots of choices there of actual whole foods where you can get choline. Um, then it's vitamin C, um, extremely important for several biochemical reactions, but also interacts with the next C, which is extra dark natural chocolate. One of my favorites because it actually contains magnesium. It has the process by which it's made, uh, main makes uh, makes it has uh, a prebiotic fiber in it. Also iron. And it has iron. Mm -hmm. It is actually the largest source of plant-based iron. So, but the trick is that you need vitamin C for the absorption. And so, I love to pair an extra piece, extra dark chocolate with a piece of clementine a piece of orange just because it helps. There's the vitamin C to help it. Chocolate's but, a special food. Let's pause on this one. Yeah, Even, you know, traditions that used it thousands of years ago, yeah. whether it's the Aztecs, they would combine yes. it with things that are high in vitamin C, like peppers, yes. for example. You know, So interesting. Right? It's right. It's so fascinating. And, and how, how people have, how this has, has come to be. And I, I happen to love that combination because people want a little bit of um, something sweet. And, and if you can just kind of get used to extra dark chocolate, it is delicious. The um, other C is for chickpeas because of the tryptophan in chickpeas. So it's a good food to um, help with these different symptoms. It's just a good good thing to add the fiber and all of that. The A is for ash ashwagandha, one of the supplements that actually has, uh, because it's very bitter tasting. Trust me, I've tasted this as a kid. Um, it, it's not worth tasting it. It's actually easy to get as a supplement, but it has a good amount of evidence for anxiety and it comes from sort of Ayurvedic times and people People have used it. Antioxidants, because we know that there's so many in that we get through the foods we eat from spices and herbs to those colorful kaleidoscope of vegetables, um, those plant polyphenols that are bringing back, you know, vitamins and micronutrients. Um, and uh, then the L is for, believe it or not, liquids. And this is because when we are dehydrated and we short, we haven't drank enough water that day, you can actually develop you can develop a panic attack, but you can also have more anxiety. 
um, dehydration is also associated with depression and a low mood. So just making sure that, you know, you're sipping throughout the day, maybe you're carrying a sustainable water bottle, but you're just hydrating. Another way to do that is with a calming tea. So I talk about passion flower tea and lavender, lavender tea in the book, just different alternatives for people to lean into to help, um, help with calming. Also green tea, one of my favorites. So, and then M is more omega-3s. You know, we know that omega-3s help people, wild caught salmon or short chain omegas in things like wal walnuts or flax seeds or chia seeds. Absorption is different, but you know, just remember we, we need those, those um, we need more omegas. And then the S is for spices and herbs, something we often overlook that can have powerful properties that can help calm the mind. So it's just a little cheat sheet to keep in mind when you, when you at the supermarket or farmer's market, wherever you shop, and then I go, you know, deeper and wider into more foods in the book. I love this. So many things jumped out there. The one that jumped out the most, though, for me was the liquids. Yes. You know, but then it becomes so logical. Like, what are the basic human needs if you're yeah. not giving your body this input? Yes. And, you know, your your cells are dehydrated. Yeah. And there's like a gauge in our brain as well, the hypothalamus. Yes. Right, this master gland integrating mm -hmm. our endocrine system, our nervous system. Yes. And it's monitoring your hydration levels. And, it, and, and that's an excellent point, Sean, because one of my tricks when people are feeling feeling super hungry, when I'm working clinically with individuals, they're like, well, you know, if I, if, and, and, and this all often comes around when I'm trying to kind of work with people around how do you shop the supermarket? So we develop this anti-anxiety anti shopping list. But often, you know, if you're going to the supermarket hungry and anxious, you get to make the wrong choices. I, I'm just, I, I don't think I need a research study sh to show that, yeah. but I think we can each <laughs> experience that. Yeah. So I'll say to my patients, you know, if you're leaving work and, or you, you're getting to the supermarket and you're feeling hungry, drink a, a cool, just to, just drink a bottle of water. Have a glass of water, a bottle of water, because ex of exactly the fact that those signals are often crossed in the brain. And so when we are hungry, we might actually be thirsty. And when you satiate that thirst, you think like, I can I can have dinner in an hour and I'll be okay. I think it's it's a neat trick to know, um, and very important. And it's something that we overlook because most people, you know, I practice an integrated and holistic um, care uh, model of care in nutritional psychiatry. So it's, nutrition is the absolute pillar. It starts it starts there. But your sleep is important. Your hydration is important. Your outdoor time because of vitamin D is important. So all of this matters. And I just think it's um, we have we have to pay attention to these small things and and build up on them absolutely absolutely one of the other interesting things that you talk about in the book is leptin mm -hmm. right and noting that leptin is a key link between our central nervous system and our metabolic processes yes. can you talk a little bit about that leptin is that hormone that helps us understand that we're satiated and we've we've eaten enough and when we are, when our diet is offset by, say, the standard American diet and eating those types of foods, what might happen is we may develop leptin resistance over time. And w w disrupting leptin means that it can't do its job. So it actually can't tell you or tell us that we're full. Um, so you might, you know, think, well, oh, I'm hungry, I'll have some dinner. And then you think, oh, you know, I'm that's not enough pasta, it's not enough, whatever you usually, you know, whatever your traditional dinner is and you need more food. That's something to start paying attention to because if it becomes, there might be just a day that you exercised more and you're just more hungry. There might also be something that you're noticing as a pattern in your life and it's time to pay attention to that. The interesting thing that I discovered in my research for this book is that the, the hot, hot spots for anxiety in the brain are the amygdala and the hippocampus. But it turns out that metabolism is linked because it also originates and is driven by certain parts of the brain. So when we start to realize that if our metabolism is thrown off, one of the ways being developing leptin resistance or just eating poorly, so maybe setting, up, setting ourselves up for inflammation and the disruption of that hormone system, um, the, the more that that metabolism is is out of whack, the more our anxiety can increase. I don't, I don't know that we have a, a study to prove this, but one of the things that happened in the pandemic is processed food sales increased remarkably in 
early 2020 when the pandemic started and increased. In fact, some food companies started to produce more things because of the need um, and other reasons. Um, things like you know canned soups and other processed foods because there was an increased demand and that kind of continued through. Now, I think that we, like I said, we, we are beyond that now and we need to kind of figure out what is our way back to to a healthier point, um, to a less anxious point, because all of that's been driven by many different things. But one of the things has been the food that we were consuming, including what our kids were consuming. Yeah. You know, some of the decisions that we make under a stress state tend to get stuck. Yes. And, you know, that's what we're dealing with right now. And a lot of abnormal behavior, responses, fear, stress, yes. anxiety, all these things there are these long tail effects, especially yes. when it's like an emotionally driven thing, yes. um, you know, into our psyche. And that that part is, you know, one of the things that wasn't being addressed. It was kind of like all or nothing. One yeah. button is pushed down and we didn't approach this with some sustainability, thinking yeah. long term about human health. And in particular, there's gonna be some unwanted side effects or long lasting effects that we're not really looking at during times of stress. Mm. And so with that being said, having resources like this to recalibrate yes. is it obviously important. And right now, society at large is just not pointing at that. You know, mm. we're looking at the next stressful event. We're just yes. kind of looped in because as you know, once our nervous system kind of gets trained a certain way, we, we're looking to feed it a certain way. And mm. this is metaphorically and literally. <laughs> and literally, you know. It, true. And so with this being said, helping us for example like you mentioned the amygdala being a big source of this and this is in in some ways you know more of a primitive part of our brain it's more mm. reactive more mm -hmm. emotional yes. but what we don't often understand is that you know we have this highly evolved prefrontal cortex yeah. but it can we can get have an amygdala hijack take mm -hmm. place mm -hmm. pretty easily that yes. part of our brain can just kind of take over yes and so some of those triggers are nutrient deficiencies mm -hmm. Uh, hunger. Yes. Right. We could start mm -hmm. acting very different. When we aggressive, when we're hungry. assertive. Yeah. We got yeah. hangry in our lexicon now. Yes. <laughs> but this is serious. Like if we're looking at leptin and the yeah. function of leptin, like actually feeling satiated, mm -hmm. so that we're not contributing to or exacerbating anxiety. This is exactly it. Um, ex exacerbating anxiety setting ourselves up for you know insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes it's it's all it's kind of all circular it's all interrelated but the other thing that i like that you said Sean is that stress precipitates we know that stress precipitates habit circuits in the brain so when you are um you've had this prolonged period of stress and you continue to be stressed that's why I feel like it's also more of this holistic approach because how, how can we manage our stress better? What can we do to step back from it? What can we do to cut through that stress cycle that we're in? Because what's that do, what that is doing is you go buy the fast food or you, you go buy something that's less healthy, but then your body wants more. And the more stressed you are, it, it just it sets up this vicious cycle. So we do have to find a way to... Um, un unpack that, understand it, but then intervene for ourselves, you know, mm. and and help get help from one another to say, hey, you know, probably shouldn't be eating that every night or whatever it is. Can we talk about some things to look at nutritionally to support leptin? Yes. Um, so some of the things to do are to, it's, it's not necessarily a, it's, it's not necessarily a huge surprise, but you want to move that diet towards the healthier norm of your whole foods. So if we were to talk about a nutritional psychiatry anti-anxiety plate, I want you to think about it as A, whole foods, B, largely those colorful vegetables and maybe some berries or you know some sort of side of fruit that you can enjoy, but a very large portion of your plate should be that way. Then I want you to think about, you know, a palm-sized portion of a clean protein. For you, that may be, you know, um, pasture-raised chicken. For someone else, it might be, um, you know, baked tofu. Whatever it is, a good source of protein could be legumes, beans, lentils, all of that. 
Then I want you to think of your little serving of a healthy fat. It can be from avocado, it can be from olive oil, nuts and seeds. And then I want you to think about a small portion of a healthy grain. One of my go-tos is now quinoa because it can be flavored up in a lot of different ways. I don't want you to have a ton of it. I want it to be on your plate because your gut microbes need it. And our... um, you know, society tends to go towards other grains which have a different uh, glycemic load, different glycemic index, and they can impact our health differently. But I want it to be a portion of your plate. By simply doing these tweaks, you are tapping into a few things. You are fending off inflammation in your gut. You are almost eating an anti-inflammatory diet by having these whole foods. You are helping fend off that, you know, say you're on the way to developing some leptin resistance, you are fending that off because you are recalibrating your microbiome. You are recalibrating that in a way that's going to ultimately help your anxiety. And you, I think paying attention to it becomes important. And then based on that plate, you can switch it up in many different ways. But I kind of want people to think about the ratios of that. Whereas, you know, things like the food pyramid and other iterations of a healthy eating plate don't quite capture that. Um, And I feel like we need to reinvent that for ourselves, Mm. especially when dealing with conditions and mental health. Mm, Yes. Um, Obviously, again, this is a huge pillar because our tissues are made from food. The the chemistry, you know, our neurotransmitters, our hormones, all these things are made from food. So this is a top tier importance, but you've also shared throughout this conversation that it's more than the food as well yes you know it's your environment it's you know your exposure to sunlight and and stress management all these things and you shared very openly in the book that you were struggling with your own metabolic health Mm -hmm. and your own mental health Um, and a lot of people especially in our society today with your level of expertise and worrying about the judgment yes and Mm -hmm. what impacted you know you going through chemotherapy Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this impacting your metabolism Mm -hmm. And you wanting to, you know, manage your own metabolic health mm-hmm. and, as I mentioned, your mental health and just feeling incongruent and yes. struggling with that. Yes. And you shared that very openly in the book, but yeah. people don't know yes. your story. They don't know what you yes. went through. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about that? I'm happy to. Thanks for asking. You know, I, um, I'm i still, honestly, in my life, in my career, in my own physical and mental health, I'm coming back from that. And it takes much longer than... Um, you know, a number in a medical chart or a, uh, an assessment by a doctor. And so for me, I really wanted to share with people that I come to it with a certain level of experience and honesty. When I say experience, I don't mean that I know it all. It's more that I've lived that. And in some t- at, some, at certain points, I continue to because I'm not at that point where uh, that I want to be, but I also believe it's a journey. And that is why I have not only hope, but I want to impart that to people and I want to share that we don't have to be perfect eaters, but we have to move towards that healthier direction. You know, we can't avoid a processed food. So for me, it was really about understanding the level of stress that I was carrying and not realizing. And one of the moments that that really changed for me was um, early on in in putting parts of the book together, um, I had a medical checkup, one of my follow-ups with my oncology team. And, you know, they kind of checked me out and did the exam and all of that. And the end of it, I was kind of caught by surprise because they said, well, you know, we love you. We want we want to see you, but we, we're going to graduate you. And I was like, what are, you, what are you talking about, graduate me? But you, there's actually a process where you move from, you know, follow-up to the survivorship clinic, right, which is a big word in, in cancer care. And so I, I left... You know, I left feeling like a huge weight had been lifted that I didn't even know was there. Um, And so just what it means is that in the future, the next follow up was actually with a different team and they were focused on the lifestyle factors and helping you survive and thrive versus the acuteness of, you know, where your blood tests at, where your where's your exam at, all of that acute stuff. And it taught me an amazing thing about anxiety because I didn't realize the the tension I was living with because I had, you know, I was functioning through it, I was writing books, I was doing all this stuff. And um, in some ways maybe 
some of it was was actions that were more robotic that were divorced from my emotion yeah. and i had to catch myself i really had to realize that integration so i've learned the hard way but it was a good lesson and it was a happy lesson um you know and i uh, and i hope that people will be with me on this journey helping their own anxiety because it is a journey it 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 doesn't it doesn't happen overnight but there's hope you know i think i think we can help one another and move this conversation forward yeah um you know it's just for me i think it's so important for us to stack conditions in our favor yes and also be very well aware that life is not going to go according to some <laughs> linear perfect yeah. plan uh, a lot of times our perfect plans whatever that might be there's all kinds of struggle and mm -hmm. craziness and chaos mm -hmm. that's qualifying us in a way for that life yes and it's just finding ways to to grow to mm -hmm. become stronger resilient mm -hmm. and carry on forward you know and it's like this life is really a a, a figuring out process for ourselves mm -hmm. in our unique mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. you know and you've been just such a light you know ever since you first came into this studio into this room you know a couple years ago okay. and actually it was my house first is yes, where you came yes, the first time yes. and just being able to you know um have access to you and to your insights mm -hmm. and you know if you have conversations um b besides the show and it's just really special because like all of this experience that you have and putting it together in a resource for us and also sharing your own story like that's the part that a lot of so-called experts don't do. Like, do you really know what you're saying? Have you <laughs> applied this? Have you lived it? In yeah. practical life right, right. and found ways and found truths that apply not just, you know, on paper, but mm -hmm. to our lives as human beings. Thank you. You know, you, you've been a, a dear, extremely dear friend, Sean, just in, in my own journey and my own learning as an author in this world. But you know it's so true. I, I I thank you for saying that because I don't want to portray to the world that there's this perfect way to eat. It's not that. It we're human. You know, life is to be enjoyed, and and finding that way forward is is where the solutions lie. You know, um, I wanted people to have like an anti-anxiety grocery list because when you wherever you shop you want to put those foods front and forward because I had to do that myself. I had to reimagine my supermarketing. I had to reimagine things when I found that I was dealing with this metabolism in a different way caused by other reasons. You know, I never assume when someone is working on the anxiety or the anything in their life, any, any type of physical or mental problem, I, I never assume um, because I've learned the hard way what they may be going through. Um, and so... I just think it's important to have grace with one another, um, especially in food and the nutrition space, because we're learning. We're all here to learn and share and help one another. It's it's not about you being right versus you know this method or that method or this food or that food. I think I think we have to get beyond that. Yeah, what you share is more so there are certain pillars, mm -hmm. right? And you share these in the book: pillars for calming our minds. Yes. Let's yes. talk a little bit about some of those. So I'm going to give you some of them. Um, and so I have six pillars, and one of them we actually covered early on. Mm -hmm. It's something people sometimes overlook. Let's look at the foods, the anxiety-producing foods that you want to. You may not realize the ketchup or the other things that we're eating that may be driving anxiety because of the things like hidden ingredients like sugar. Another one is be whole, um, uh, eat whole to be whole. And, and what... That is, it's, it's that eat the orange, eat the apple, skip the juiced versions of them, meaning the store-bought apple or orange juice has added sugar, no fiber in it. Um, the more times that you can have a piece of salmon instead of a fish stick or a processed chicken nugget is going to be very different um, for that. And another one that I really want to bring forward is I created, developed a recipe called the Calming Kaleidoscope Salad because in the book I talk about a lot of the bioactives and micronutrients that we overlook. We've touched on some of those today, but the salad is really how do you put together that nutritional psychiatry plate, the, you know, enhance the biodiversity of your gut, enhance the fiber, the micronutrients, the, fi the polyphenols. And that's another pillar because I want people to kind of remember that's 
something they can go to all the time. Um, and so I would, I, lo- I would love for people to check it out. All right, so those are a couple of the pillars that are featured in the new, new book, Calm Your Mind with Food. And again, all six pillars are here. And this is basically a consolidation of things at the end of the book after you learn about all these incredible foods and insights. But I want to ask you about one more of these pillars, which, again, to hear from your perspective, these words is is what I'm excited about. And one of the pillars is to find consistency and balance. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. So it's um, such a critical it was so critical in my own journey. It was so critical in the journey of my patients. This is a marathon and not a sprint. You, you're you not going to eat um, dark chocolate and a uh, piece of clementine tonight and lose your anxiety tomorrow. It's about replacing the maybe the ice cream that you've been eating during the pandemic. Many people did that. It was a way to bring the family together and just enjoy something that felt comforting. Um, switch it out with banana ice cream from you know my first book and you can even make a chocolate flavor but most importantly find find a replacement for the things you love or a version of it and still once in a while enjoy that food because it's about the balance and consistency we want this nutritional psychiatry anti-anxiety plan to calm your mind to be sustainable to to help you maybe lower doses of medication maybe work with your doctor to come off medications over time or maybe you won't need the medication at all or maybe you'll just stay the same with your medication but still have lowered anxiety the, these are powerful things food is powerful if you embrace it but you need to just find a way to be consistent find the balance of what works for you the foods you enjoy the um the the dietary pattern that appeals to you because i'm not here to tell you eat this or not that that is not my mentality because i respect people and the choices they make and i feel like that's not my role i i can't tell you sean don't ever eat a certain food it's can i but i can say hey could you get a healthier version of it could you source it from a different place could you maybe prepare it in an air fry instead of this way for me that's the best way i can guide you and it's without judgment because I think when we get judgmental about food and we lose that consistently, we lose the balance, we start running after a certain food versus another, and we lose ourselves. We we, we get more anxious and we kind of lose the end game. So uh, that's, to me, why consistency and balance are the key. Calm your mind with food. Can you tell people where they can pick up a copy? Yes, uh, you can go to my website, umanaidumd.com. Sign up for my newsletter where I give you tips every week. But you can also order the book there. But you can also support your local bookstore or um, your online retailer that you like. And uh, you can find it on my social media links at D-R-U-M-A-N-A-I-D-O-O. And I hope you'll check it out and let me know what you think. Awesome. We'll put all the links to everything, of course, in the show notes. Calm your mind with food. I appreciate you, Dr. Uma Naidu. Thank you so much, Sean. So good to be here. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here to uplevel your health today. Men and menopausal women probably have the easiest transition to fasting because their hormones, there's not as much fluctuation. If you're already lean and you're still at peak fertility years, so 35 and under, you have to be careful about when you're fasting.